This is Teaching High School Chem's webinar, Five Strategies to Boost Student Engagement. So welcome, welcome. It's October. You've probably had your first quarter. And I am in Madison, Mississippi, right outside of Jackson. And every year, I don't quite believe it's going to cool down because it's just blazing hot constantly for months and months and months and months. But just in the last couple of days, y'all, it has finally cooled down. And so we're so enjoying the weather here. And I hope you're enjoying weather wherever you are joining us from. So welcome. You are in the right place if you're new to teaching or you're new to teaching chemistry. Glad you're here. You're going to learn a ton. Um, if you're struggling to keep students in your class engaged, obviously the title shows you you are in the right place. And even if you're an experienced chemistry teacher, um, but you're always looking for ways to improve your class, we welcome you. Let's share ideas. We're so glad you're here too. So um, I will be your support person in the background. Um, Jeff Anderton is going to be your webinar presenter. And so if you press participants and then um, there's a chat section in there and that's where I'm going to be gathering um, or seeing any of your comments or questions or things that you might want to share and um, make sure that Jeff sees this for you. Um, stay on till the end because just for being here, Jeff has prepared a really juicy bonus to give you for your classrooms. So let me introduce Jeff Anderton to you. He has a lot of chemistry experience, starting from when he first studied it in high school. It's been 27 years. That's a lot of chemistry studying. Um, he has a chemical engineering degree from Georgia Tech. He also um, has a secondary science education degree from Kennesaw State with a chemistry focus. He has been teaching for more than 15 years. He's also been in an academic dean or an interim headmaster role. So he has even had, you know, that administrative um, experience. So he knows what it's like inside and outside of the classroom and how schools work. So he's bringing that expertise to you today as well. He's my husband of 11 years, daddy to our five-year-old son and our seven-month-old daughter. Here he is. Good afternoon. Hello. We're so excited. What have you prepared for us? All right. So I'm excited that you're taking some time out of your weekend during the school year to, to grow yourself. Because um, here at Teaching High School Cam, that's what we're about. We're about helping you grow as teachers. And so today we're going to look at that with looking at student engagement and five strategies to boost our student engagement. So with that, let me start sharing the presentation. So five strategies to boost student engagement in your chem class, how to have an engaged class without having to entertain them or just being too easy. You know, but I think that's where people have the hesitancy with, with student engagement. Like they wanna engage their students, but they don't wanna sacrifice or give up what it means for them to be a teacher of integrity. And so that's what we're looking at today. There we go. All right, you're in the right place if you're new to teaching or you're an experienced teacher, either way. Um, you end up having only your best and your brightest really paying attention in class. And the other ones are just kind of there, taking up a space and a seat, um, but they're not really engaged and with you, which oftentimes leads to this one. If you have what we call an inverted bell curve, meaning you have your best and your brightest in the A range, and then you've got kind of this group that's low Bs, mid Cs, you know, and you got very few other grades. Um, that kind of tends to be fairly normal for most chemistry classes. And I'm a firm believer that after this webinar, you'll have the skills to close that gap, to bring in that B and C range students and bring them up to make more of a normal looking bell curve. You're in the right place if you hear things like, this is too hard or I'm confused, or I don't like you, <laughs> you know, or your class, or whatever. Because to me, all of these things, when kids are saying those things, it's a symptom of disengagement. It's a symptom that they're not in it with you. Um, and so we need to be paying attention to those kind of things when they pop up. 
All right, so here's what we're gonna be learning. We're gonna focus on what I think are the three main areas where that often derail student engagement. The first one has to do with communication. So we're gonna look at how we structure and present lessons to maximize engagement without having to put on a show or being too easy. So how we communicate it, how we structure and present our lessons. Second area we're gonna look at is how to take proactive steps to limit distractions, because distractions is the other just major enemy of student engagement. And we're gonna look at strategies to minimize it, because we can't get rid of them. You know, there's just too many things going on in a school day to get rid of them. But we can minimize it, we can really limit their impact. The third area we're gonna look at is how to grow it by building your relationship with your student. And once again, this is not being too easy, this isn't being like the super fluffy, you know, huggy teacher or the cheerleader teacher. That has to do with personalities and that's something different than engagement. And so we're gonna pull out of that five strategies to use. So make sure you stay to the end. Um, I'll send you an email afterwards with some links, including a copy of the PDF of these slides. Um, so if I start going too fast and it's too hard to keep track of everything, I'll take care of that. And then I will also give you my full lesson plans and my, for my covalent nomenclature unit. Now, when I say my full lesson plans, that means this is more than just simply handouts and stuff. This is all of my student handouts, all of my labs, quizzes, review sheet, test, but also my teaching notes and then instructional videos on how to teach. And it includes not just covalent nomenclature, but polarity and Vesper as well. So you'll get all of those handouts and units and everything um, for you when we get to the end. All right, so my story. Um, I've always been that kid, I liked school for the most part. Every now and then I got bored. <laughs> Um, but I was one of those really bright kids who would kind of halfway pay attention and still learn everything and just be really lazy and not do homework and that kind of stuff. So I was always kind of that one who drove my teachers nuts, I think. Not to mention, I don't think I turned in a paper without a wrinkle until I was in 10th grade. Um, and even then, it was probably only about half my papers got turned in without wrinkles. Um, I was just that very disorganized, disjointed kid. Uh, when I got to college, going to Georgia Tech, you know, it's a research school primarily. And so we have professors that are really good at their subjects, but really, really bad at teaching. And so I had, you know, my teacher for physical chemistry one. He was brilliant. Probably one of the smartest people I've ever met. But he couldn't communicate with people who weren't as brilliant as him. You know, he had a PhD in physical chemistry and anything and everything. I never wanted to learn about electrons. And this was my first exposure to it. This is physical chemistry one. I don't know what he's talking about. You know, I mean, I had one page of notes that it was all equations and symbols and like 10 words. And that was it, you know, because he never could translate it down, you know. And so we've all of us struggled through that class. I ended up making a 54 which was the second highest grade in the class because the highest grade was a 60. I made an A with a 54, but I didn't learn anything. Um, and then I had another teacher who did chemical reactor design, which is about as exciting as it sounds, um, for an hour and a half at eight o'clock in the morning with PowerPoint slides with the lights turned down. You know, I'm not one to fall asleep in class, but I certainly did in that class. Um, the teacher just didn't create an environment to make it engaging. And so that's kind of what we don't want to do. Because I've always been looking around. I'm always that person who's, I think it's that scientist in me. I'm always looking and observing and trying to find that what I like and what I don't like. Even before I knew I wanted to be a teacher, I was always kind of like critiquing and figuring out what things work and what things didn't. Like, for example, I hated pop quizzes. I don't give them. I always hated it when teachers didn't give me very good instructions about what I needed to do. And so I'm always really try as a teacher to be very clear on what my expectations are. And then, you know, I generally try to set very high expectations and then try to help my kids get there. But along my time, kind of like Ariel mentioned, you know, as a teacher, as an administrator, I've learned kind of overarching themes. First and foremost, teaching and Student engagement is not about your teaching style. 
Your teaching style is about your personality. I run a very laid back classroom. That's my style. Other people teach very, you know, they have very structured classrooms with every minute is structured in order and designed to be a certain way. And that's just definitely not my personality. But in both situations, you can have really good student engagement. You can have people who are, tend to be more on the sarcastic side like me, or you can have people who are on the very just bubbly, encouraging, always happy personality, but you can have good student engagement either way. Um, and then I also learned that when it comes to student engagement, we need lots of tools in our toolbox. Every year is different. Every class period is different. What works well to get my students engaged in one year may not work as well the next. And so as we talk about these five strategies, I'm going to give you some sub points underneath it, right? So usually when we hear about student engagement, what we hear is we hear teachers complaining. And that's, I've never been a fan of being around complaining. It always, it's because it's negative and it just makes me feel more negative. But here's the thing, when we are complaining about students, we make a critical mistake oftentimes with who is in control and who has the power. Because when, if I were to walk in and say, you know, I, I just can, Susie just talks all period long and no matter what I want her to do, whatever we're doing in class, she just keeps talking. And the problem is when I'm talking like that, I'm saying that it's 100% Susie's fault. And I had a mentor years ago tell me that when you make something 100% somebody else's fault, you give yourself 0% of the power to fix it. Well, yeah, Susie's, Susie's making choices, but it's my classroom. It's not 100% Susie's fault that she's talking. I have some power, I have some responsibility over my classroom. So I can take action and I can work with Susie and I can speak into that situation and I can give her, you know, say, hey, Susie, you can choose to pay attention or you can choose to sit in the hall. You know, hey, Susie, you can choose to pay attention or you can choose to have a detention. Like I can give her things, I have power. <laughs> you know, the students don't run my classroom, I do. And I think that's one of the things we have to be careful of when we start complaining about student engagement is are we giving away our power and not being proactive when we need to be? And so I think that's important as we think about student engagement. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, these are the three main areas that I think where we can get derailed in terms of student engagement. Communication of content, managing distractions, and the student-teacher relationship. So let's look at the first one. Communication of content. So I want you to picture this. You have been a fan of all things Parisian and you've wanted to go to Paris all your life. And so you save up your money and you travel to Paris and you hire a tour guide to show you around. And you go to meet the tour guide and the tour guide pulls out a map and starts kind of rotating it and flipping it and being like, which way to Notre Dame? I don't remember where Notre Dame is. Where you full well know that in Paris, they don't call it Notre Dame, it's the Cathedral of Notre Dame. You know, and you're like, oh my gosh, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. They can't be my tour guide, please. And immediately you're starting to discount them in your mind. Immediately you're like, all right, I gotta find another tour guide. Well, that's kind of the, where the first strategy comes in. Is we have to know our stuff. You know, when it comes to chemistry, we are the tour guide. We are the one showing our kids around and showing them how to do it. And so we've got to know our stuff and we've got to be prepared. Because um, when we walk in the class not prepared, our kids are going to zone out. If we come in and we really don't know what we're talking about, our kids are going to zone out. Um, I remember being in seventh grade and having a teacher who didn't know squat trying to teach seventh grade science. And I think the only reason I paid attention at all is because I was already at that age um, developing a bad habit that I've been working on for years of being technically correct and correcting people. I think I enjoyed correcting a teacher and telling her when she was wrong. Um, and so I think that's the only reason I paid attention in that class. 
Um, otherwise, I just didn't care because she didn't know what she was talking about. Um, and that's kind of sad for a seventh grader to say. So the two kind of sub things under this is if chemistry content is something that you struggle with, you've got to find some resources to help you. Because um, research shows that 60% of chemistry teachers do not have a chemistry background. Research shows that most of them are coming from biology backgrounds or math backgrounds. Heck, 3% of chemistry teachers in the US in high school have elementary childhood education degrees. And yet they're being asked to teach chemistry. That scares me to death. Um, what would they know about chemistry? And chemistry is probably, once again, in my honest opinion, probably the hardest prep in all of high school. And I have taught in my teaching career pretty much every science and math from seventh grade to 12th grade. Um, and I still think chemistry is probably the hardest prep out of all of them, even though it's the one I love the most. And then you also need to find time that you need to be prepped. Um, if you're early on in your teaching career, this just takes time. <laughs> um, you just got to put in the hours and it's hard. Um, as you get more experience, you're going to run into days where you're just not ready to teach that day. Um, you're just not prepped and you can either try to like put together a lesson on the fly, which depending upon how well you know the content may or may not work very well. You know, you've got to decide what you're going to do about that. And so, you know, for me, sometimes I have just kind of little tools in my, my tool belt that I use because Sometimes if I know it's a good class that I can get away with just winging it, I'll wing the lesson. But if it's a class where that's not going to work so well, I will kind of get them started on a topic talking and then I'll let them run it down rabbit trails and I will go with it. And they think they're getting me off topic and I'm full well willing and letting it happen. You know, and they think, Oh, they, they pulled a quick one on Mr. Anderton. No, I, I let them do it, <laughs> you know, or, I sometimes use these for teachable moments. I have certain YouTube channels that I love, Smarter Every Day, Veritasium, Physics Girl. These are really great YouTube channels. And sometimes if I'm just, I just need an extra little bit of time to get my head around what I need to do, I'll show a video that's not necessarily perfectly on topic, but it's something scientific that we can discuss in science class and can just once again buy me a little bit of time. Because um, we all need that every now and then. We all just have that life crisis where things happen. All right. So that's the first strategy. You know, just knowing your stuff and being prepared. All right. So second picture. So I want you to imagine this is a picture taken in a market in Croatia. And this woman is selling all the ingredients you need to make a good salad. You got tomatoes and cucumbers and tomatoes and radishes and some, some lettuce there. I see some onions on the table behind her. And so, once, like I said, this is in Croatia. This is in the city of Split, Croatia. And when you go to buy these things, one of two things is most likely the case. Either one, you don't know a lick of Croatian. And this just becomes, buying the ingredients for a salad becomes something that's very difficult and hard and probably a little confusing to do. But you can work through it and you can kind of maybe work through the language barrier if you're willing to try hard enough. Or you can be just frustrated and say, forget it, I'll go buy a salad at a restaurant where they speak English, you know, whatever. Or maybe you're like I was, I knew a little bit of Croatian and I could talk to her and kind of you know, do a little bit of like understand prices and that kind of stuff. But if she wanted to have a conversation with me, I'd be lost in a heartbeat because she'd be speaking Croatian so fast, I wouldn't be able to tell where one word ended and the next one began. I'd be like, um, 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 pardon, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be lost. Um, I'd be confused. And so I think this helps us to understand kind of what chemistry is like for our kids, because you now in the first situation where you don't understand the language, your best and your brightest are going to fight those ones who like have to have an A or their mom, their dad's going to disown them or so they think. No, they're the ones that are going to push through and bust it to try to communicate with you, even if they don't understand. And so, but the average kid's just going to be like, wait, 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 you're speaking another language. I'm checking out. I'm out of here. And this is where we hear things like it's hard or I'm confused. That's where this comes in. 
And so that's our cue that, hey, something's wrong in our communication. So when I say speak their language, first thing I mean is build off of what they already know. What did you cover in the last chapter? What did they learn in ninth or 10th grade in physical science? Um, are they fans of Harry Potter? Are they big into the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Whatever it may be, use those things to help them. You know, like when I'm talking about um, covalent bonding and the idea of sharing electrons. You know, usually that's not, it's around football season. And so we can talk about football. And I've always taught at small private schools uh, for most of my teaching career where, you know, it takes 22 guys to make a full football team, 11 on offense, 11 on defense. And we usually didn't have 22 guys playing. And I'd be like, hey, what would happen if we only had 16? And they're like, oh, some of the players have to play both ways. And I'm like, exactly. Some of the players have to be shared between offense and defense. And so in a covalent bond, we don't have enough for everybody to have eight electrons. So we share both atoms get to count some of these together. And they get that. And that makes sense to them. I'm building off of something they already understand. You know, which goes with the second one of using illustrations. Like I did with you, with the person, you know, the tour guide in Paris, or trying to buy vegetables in Croatia. It's like, it's something that I'm, I'm drawing a picture in your mind that you can connect with and say, okay, I get that. Oh, I see. That's how that applies to what we're learning now. And so that's part of speaking their language. And then, especially in a science class like chemistry, avoid technical definitions or being technically correct especially if you're someone who has a more of a chemistry background, you've got to be cautious of using big words. Like this is one of my favorite words. I love this word, perspicuous. And I love it because it's ironic. It means something is easy to understand, but it's this weird word no one's ever heard. And that's why I just find it amusing. Um, but when we're talking to kids, we need to be careful to not be overly technical. I mean, I remember when I took chemistry in high school, or I took Chem 2 in high school, I had a teacher who had a PhD in chemistry, Dr. Morton. And when we would ask her a question, she would sit there and pause. And it'd be a good 10 seconds or sometimes more before she would respond. And at first, we were like, does she not know what she's talking about? But no, 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 no. She was doing this she was taking the time to sit there and go, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. How can I explain this without confusing them? Because especially if you have that chemistry background, the real explanation to so many of these things is so complicated, it's not worth it in a regular chemistry class to do it. Um, it's easier to just to say, um, let me give you the most basic definition. If you wanna learn more, take AP Chem next year or go be a chemistry major. You know, like you'll, you'll figure this out later. You know, once again with covalent bonds, octet rule. You know, when I'm doing Lewis dot structures, I, I only do the most, I do eight. I don't do things like boron, which only needs six valence electrons. I don't do things like xenon, which is, you know, extra, you know, beyond the octet. Like I don't do the exceptions. I do just the basics. I keep it simple. You know, what do they need to know? Um, they don't need all the technically correct, all the exceptions in there. Um, it's just too much. And so that's a big part about speaking their language. Because once again, when a teacher, when a kid says, it's too hard, I don't get it, I don't understand. This is the first place we need to look. Are we explaining it in such a way that they can understand? So moving into the strategy three, Make your content digestible. Um, there's the old saying out there, how do you eat an elephant? One piece at a time. So how do you digest chemistry? One piece at a time. We've got to break it down into small pieces. Um, a teacher that I did my student teaching with, she really helped me see this. Um, I was there and they were doing nomenclature and they were doing ionic nomenclature. Well, she, she did it all together. So it was covalent and ionic, and she had a handout that had a hundred formulas or names on it, and the kids had to work through it over the course of a week. 
And she was like, how long would it take you to do this? And I'm, I'm like, I don't know. She's like, you'd be limited by how fast you could write. Because for you, this is memorization. You know, you're just putting out facts. Like you just know it and you can just write it down. She's like, think about it. For a student, when they look at a formula, they have to say, all right, is it ionic or covalent? And then if it's ionic, they have to figure out if, it's, if it has a transition metal or a normal metal. And then they have to figure out if the negative part is a regular non-metal or a polyatomic ion. And if it's a polyatomic ion, what name is it? Like that they have to go through all of these steps. And what she taught me to do was to take each step and teach that as a piece. Teach that as a bite-sized piece. Now, you can still break things into pieces, but still go too fast. You know, I mean, I can still, you know, you can take small marshmallows and still fill your mouth so full that you can't swallow anything because you put too many in at once. Um, you still got to make it so that it's, it's digestible. Um, and this kind of goes with the building example before. I have a picture of a cake here because one of the things I enjoy doing in my free time, which, ooh, I have so much of with two kids at home. Um, is is baking shows. I love watching baking shows. I don't, I'm not a baker. I prefer to like cook like entrees and stuff. I'm not a, a baking person, but I like watching baking shows. And when a baking show, like it's always, they're always under time. They're always under, under a time crunch. And without fail, somebody's going to try to assemble a cake without allowing the cake to cool completely. And so if you tried to put this cake together without allowing it to cool first, what would happen is the two cakes would be warm and they would melt that frosting in between. And when that frosting melts, it loses any stability and the cake slides and falls apart. The same thing happens with our students when we go too fast. They may have the pieces, but when they try to put them together, we, we went so fast that, the, that they don't stick together. They just slide all over the place and we just get a mess. And so it's our job not just to give them the pieces, but they go slow enough for them to master the first piece before we give them the second. Then they master the second, then we give them the third. They master the third, we give them the fourth, and we just build on it slowly but surely. And part of what we have to do is we have to, between this one and the last one, is we have to put it all together for them. Because if we just give them the pieces and we go slow enough, they're left with a bunch of pieces to a puzzle. And they need us to show them, hey, this is how the puzzle pieces go together to make a beautiful picture. And so we work on doing that. We, you know, at the end of a lesson, I'm gonna do, take two minutes. Hey, here's what we talked about today. Here's how you're gonna use it on your homework. This is what the expectations are for you, go. And then after we go over homework the next day, before I start into the lecture, lesson for that next day. Hey, here's what we did yesterday. What's, here's what we've been doing for the last couple of days. You see how it's all tying together and building up to this? You know, we pull it all together. Um, when I do nomenclature, I teach a big flow chart at the end. And I show them how, the, you know, when we look at a formula, what are all the steps? And I put it all together for them. And then we work together as a whole, you know, doing covalent and ionic and acids and bases all together, working it and making it all fit together and putting a nice little pretty bow on the end of it at the end. So once again, when it comes to communication, we as teachers have to be on the lookout for it's too hard, I don't get it, and I'm confused. When our kids are saying those things, that's our cue that something's going wrong in the communication. And we need to take a step back and be humble enough to look at how we're presenting things and say, all right, how do I need to fix this? What do I need to do? What can I do to help those kids? Can I say it in a, a different way that fits into their language so that they can understand it better? Or can I go slower or can I break this up or do we need to take a little bit longer on this before we have a test? You know, because I'm a firm believer that we don't wait till, as teachers, we can't wait till quizzes and tests to determine whether the kids are getting or not. We've got to be doing that all along the way. You know, we're looking at them as they're doing classwork. We're watching them as they're doing labs. We're, we're interacting with them as they're, they're going over homework. And we're seeing where the weaknesses are and we're adjusting. 
And if the kids are getting it and they're bored, I go faster. If the kids are being confused, I slow down. I adjust my pacing depending upon how the kids are getting it. And that's critically important because when we do these two things, we're fighting against them disengaging because when we don't speak their language and we go too fast or we put it in too big of pieces, they're going to check out. They're going to disengage because they don't think they can learn it. They don't think it's possible. And most people when faced with the impossible say, yeah, forget it. No, once again, we have a few of those people who are like impossible, bring it. I'm going, I'm, I'm game. I'm going to go for it. But those are few and far between. Most of our students are going to say, oh, I, I, this is, I can't do chemistry. Sorry. You know, and they're going to ride that C bus through the rest of the year and hopefully stay at a C and not drop lower. You know, but they're going to be like, it's chemistry. C is fine. I'm, you know, and they're going to give up. But when we slow down, speak their language, make it digestible, we're encouraging them by helping them get it. And when they get it, they're more likely to be engaged. You know, and it really works well that way. All right, next area, managing distractions. Teaching and distractions it seems to go hand in hand. You know, like when I get outside of the classroom, it's so hard for me because I'm not used to being able to go 20 minutes without being distracted. So when I have longer than that to work or think, it kind of feels weird to me, <laughs> you know, but that's kind of, so we got assemblies, dismissal for sports, field trips, half days, tests on other classes, students, you know, having issues outside of school that come in and affect school, world issues outside of school, community issues, whatever, student behavior. All of these things affect our classroom. And what we have to do is we have to, as teachers, take control. What can we do? Now, I don't mean absolute control because that just doesn't exist because we have to, the first thing I said right here is we, you have to go with the flow. Um, when it is pep rally day, you know, the last school I was at, we had pep rallies for every varsity game and every home JV football game, which meant we had something like 15 pep rallies during the fall, which A, shortens my class, and then B, they're all dressed up in stupid, silly theme day stuff. You know, they're dressed like cowboys and Indians or Disney characters or Marvel characters as twin day, whatever. You know, they're doing something silly. And go with the flow is, is that you kind of make comments about the kids' outfits, but then you also set, you know, kind of my next big thing, you communicate expectations of like, all right, you may be dressed silly, but guess what? It's chemistry class. <laughs> We're still doing chemistry today. Um, oh, Mr. Anderton, can't we have a free day? No, <laughs> um, you're in school, you know, we're, we're going to do school because you're in school. Um, like I said, I spent most of my time in, in private schools and it's kind of like your mommy and daddy pay me to teach you, you know, so I'm going to teach you today. Um, and so always trying to balance that of how do I go with the flow? Because I feel like if I, if I make too big of a deal of things, if I try too hard to control it, then it ends up just blowing up and getting bigger. You know, it's kind of like shaking a Coke can and trying to, you know, or shaking a bottle and trying to keep the top on without it blowing off, you know, and then all of a sudden it just finally explodes in some big dramatic fashion. Not good. So going with the flow just means you kind of, I, I accept it. I'm not going to get in a fuss about it. Because if you get in a tizzy about it being a half day, that's going to get communicated to the kids that you're upset. And then that just throws off the chemistry of the classroom. Communicate expectations also really, really important. And the other thing I think is probably the biggest distraction in a classroom is when kids miss and then come back in, whether it be an illness, but more often the more distracting one to me is when kids miss for sports dismissals. You know, it's Friday afternoon and a third of your class is gone because they're on the, the varsity football team or their cheerleaders. And then they come back into school on Monday expecting you to teach what you taught on Friday. It's like, no, 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 you missed class. <laughs> I'm moving on. 
you know, because it's, it's the day of the smartphone. It's not that hard for them. And I communicate this expectation at the beginning of the year and before every one of these events usually is, hey, you're going to miss. Your friends have smartphones. You have a smartphone. It's not that hard to take a picture of the notes and send it. Um, there's no reason for them not to have a copy of somebody's notes. It's too easy <laughs> to not. And so we try to, you know, I make very clear that you should be able to walk in my class that next day, that you're back and be able to pick up where we're at. You know, or, I mean, it kind of depends. Like if, if, if someone comes into my class and it's like, Mr. Anderton, I don't understand what we did yesterday. And I'm like, have you looked at the notes? No. You have a specific question? No. You know, that's just not going to get a whole lot of sympathy out of me. Where if a kid comes back and said, Mr. Anderton, you know, Jack sent me the notes. I read over them. I tried the homework, but I really didn't understand how to do number four, five, and six. Can you help me? And I'm going to be like, yes, I'll help you. You know, because that, ki that kid's doing his part. I'm going to, that's part of my expectations. You know, if you do your part and you're still confused, I will help you. You know, but if you're going to be lazy and not do your part and want me to help you, I'm going to be like, no, do your part first. Then I'll help you. Um, that's part of my expectations with managing distractions. Um, deal with the elephant in the room. What I mean by this is, you know, it's, you're dealing with 10th graders or 11th graders, usually. And so let's say, you know, I've ran into this many times where kids had like a big U.S. history test later in the day. And they're all just freaking out about it. And they, and if I don't say anything about it, that's just going to be kind of this murmur throughout the entire class period. There's going to be this, you know, I'm going to see notes getting slid out of desk. I'm going to see books on laps. I'm going to see, I'm going to hear whispering. And so what I do is I'm like, Oh, I, I know you have this test. Here's my, here's my expectations and here's how we're going to work this. So I take five to 10 minutes to, to lay it out. I say, all right, if I see anything other than chemistry on your desk, in your lap, in your desk, wherever, it is mine. This is chemistry class. We're going to do chemistry. But I'll make you a deal. If you focus and we get through this really, really fast, any free time we have at the end of the period is yours to study. That'll be the most focused class you'll ever have. Because as soon as somebody starts talking, they're like, shh. We got, we want time to study, stop, you know, and they, then they'll monitor and you'll, you'll blow right through the lesson and they get 10 minutes to study at the end of the period. It's a win-win, you know, because I address the elephant in the room. I'm dealing with, you know, Hey, you want to study. I want to get through this lesson. Let's, let's make this work for both of us. Or, you know, kind of along this line is taking advantage of teachable moments. Like, Kids come into my class, they just came from Algebra 2, and they just, it was a horrible test, and they felt like the teacher didn't grade it fair, and they're all up in a tizzy, and they're all just, nee, 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 nee. okay? Once again, I could try to squelch it and say, all right, we're doing chemistry now, but it's just going to be this little murmur throughout the class period. It's the elephant in the room, let me deal with it, let me address it. All right, y'all, um, I know this issue's going on, so what's going on? And I'll take five, 10 minutes and we'll talk about it. And, I'll, and I usually try to teach them, all right, you don't like how Mr. Brown did that. How did you talk to him? Oh, we said that, that, that. I'm like, oh, that was a mistake. You know, because teenagers don't know how to address authority figures that they disagree with. Uh, they usually do it in a way that prompts defensiveness and, and blaming and it just doesn't work well. <laughs> And so I take a time and I coach them, hey, try it this way. Try to approach Mr. Brown and say, Mr. Brown, would you be willing to explain this? Mr. Brown, can you help me understand this? And I try to coach them how to approach that teacher. And then once that's taken up, yeah, I may have lost 10 minutes of my class time, but now I have an engaged class for the rest of the period. Instead of having this elephant in the room that's going to just cause them to be just a little bit off for the whole period. I'd rather sacrifice five, 10 minutes 
deal with the elephant in the room, then I can focus. Now, sometimes teachable moments are big enough that they deserve a whole period. Um, 9-11. Um, when we're dealing, you know, we live in Mississippi, when a hurricane's coming. You know, I may take a little bit longer to talk about where it's going to be, how do we prepare, that kind of thing. Um, tragedy. Um, it was about my sixth or my seventh year teaching, so it's like nine years ago now. Had one of my former students, her father was tragically killed in a car accident. And had all of her friends were in my chemistry class. She wasn't at our school anymore, but all of her friends were in my chemistry class. And I remember them coming up to me, it's like, you know, can we miss your class to go be with her? And I was like, yes, go. Because they're not gonna remember what we covered in class that day, but they'll remember that they got to sit with their friend who was grieving and that friend, that young woman certainly remembers that her friends came with her the day that she found out her dad died. You know, because that's so much more important than learning about limiting reactants. Um, and so we got to, we have to be willing to trade that because, and this is going to come into play later, is I communicated to my students that they were more important than a lesson. And when my students know that I care and that I'm for them, it, it helps with engagement dramatically. Um, when it comes to behavior issues, the simplest strategy is simply to be consistent and to give consequences. Like I said, my teaching style is very laid back. I'm not a huge fan of confrontation, never have been, still not. But I have to draw the line. I've had to really grow kind of more of a backbone there and lay down the law and be like, all right, if you're going to choose to continue disrupting class, you're going to be out in the hall. And then when they do it, put them in the hall, uh, finish teaching, and then go in the hall, have a conversation with them and bring them back in. Um, usually that deters it for me. One or two times of that and we're, we're, we're good. Um, if it gets any worse than that, then, you know, I got to do detentions and administrators and all that mess. If the entire class is causing issues, then I've got to deal with the class as a whole. And usually I'll give them the first warning. Then second warning is something like, all right, guys, you're making it very difficult for me to teach this class today. So you got a choice. You can allow me to teach this class or you can choose to figure this out on your own. That's your choice. And usually that's a, that threat alone is enough for kids to be like, ooh, what? no, we need to focus, we need to be quiet, shh. But I've had two times where I had classes that didn't quiet down. And I'm like, all right, y'all, um, here's where you need to get to in the book or in the notes. Um, here's your classwork assignment, here's your homework assignment, it'll be graded tomorrow, I'm gonna be sitting at my desk. You know, because I'm like, and then they all freak out because as you know, chemistry is not one of those things that's really easy to teach yourself. Um, and so they're all kind of wigging out and you know, they'll beg and plead. And I'm like, no, you made your choice. You were given a choice and you made it. And this is called a consequence. Um, and then usually depending upon where it happened in the class period, I'll either try to have a conversation with them at the end of the period or the beginning of the next period, preferably the end of the period in question and have a conversation as of why that was the way it was um, and try to discuss that. Once again, try to make it a teachable moment. Um, needless to say, I don't generally have, I didn't have problems with the classes after that. I will also say that method is strongly dependent upon your administration. Um, I had an administration that I knew would go to bat for me even with something relatively extreme like that. Um, and so you kind of got to play your classroom management by what support you're gonna have at home from parents, what support you're gonna have from your administration that affects classroom management more than I care to think about. All right, so that's number four. So we've covered the first four. You gotta know your stuff and be prepared, that's strategy one. Strategy two, you gotta speak in their language. 
Strategy three, make it digestible, meaning small pieces and slow enough. Step four, you gotta take control of distractions. Strategy five, really in my opinion, is the foundation of everything else. My relationship with my students, your relationship with your students, is the foundation under everything that happens in your classroom. And so the strategy is very simply this. Pursue the hearts of your students. I do not mean being their best friend. I do not mean letting them in and knowing everything that goes on in your life. I don't mean being all huggy and high fivey and fist bumpy because none of those things are me. Those are not my personality. I never did that as a teacher. I don't do that. But what I do do is I make sure those kids know I'm there for them. And part of it is strategy two and strategy three, that I'm taking the time to figure out how to explain it to them and break it down into pieces for them. And I'm making sure they are able to understand it. And when, when a teacher is doing that, the kids know it. And the kids know that teacher is there to help them learn. And when they know they're there to help them learn, they're more likely to pay attention. You know, but a lot of it comes back to the golden rule. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. It's been around for 2,000 years. And it's still the truth. Um, when I was an administrator, I had a teacher who would complain about how his teach students were disrespectful. And so I went and observed, and I'm like, the guy treated his students like crap. And I'm like, why do you treat your students like that? He's like, well, because they don't respect me. And I'm like, all right, let's back up. <laughs> treat them with respect first. He's like, why? They're not respecting me. I'm like, because you're the adult. They're kids. You're the adult. Do the adult thing. <laughs> you make the first move. You set the expectations of what you want in your classroom. And the expectation of what you want in your classroom is, I want respect in my classroom, so I'm going to give it. Give respect. Give it to your kids, and then an amazing thing will happen. It'll come back at you. If, if you want your kids to listen to you, listen to them. And then they'll listen to you. You know, think about it. Like, think about how you interact with your peers. You know, if someone treats you with respect and listens and cares, you generally do the same back to them. You know, it's just human nature. And so we, we need to do that in the classroom. And for me, this kind of is summed up dealing with teenagers in what I call the, my two rules for working with teens. And once again, this comes from listening. I listen to students, I listen to teenagers, and the two things I hear teenagers complain about the most over and over and over again is when someone treats them like a child and when they get held to an impossible standard. And so my first rule of working with teens is very simply this. I will treat you like an adult until your actions deem otherwise. And what I mean by this is I'm going to respect you. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to value your input. I'm not going to dismiss you or treat you like a nuisance or treat you like a little child and order you around like an elementary school teacher. You know, that's just not going to work with high schoolers. You know, one time we had an interim headmaster who was used to working with elementary kids. And when he tried to work with high schoolers, it didn't generally go over very well because he was treating them like little kids and they didn't appreciate it. <laughs> um, and so I treat them as adults. Um, when they get whiny and pouty like five-year-olds, I will treat them like a five-year-old. When they act like goofy 12-year-olds, then I will treat them like goofy 12-year-olds. But for the most part, I treat them like adults. And once again, I think it's part of expectations. It's part of everything. They just, they rise to how you treat them. I am treating them how I want them to act, and then they start to act how I treat them. I want them to act respectful. I want them to act like adults. Then when I do it, they act that way. You know, but 
with exceptions. And that's where the second, the second rule comes in. I will not hold you to the expectations of an adult because you're not one. You're still a kid. You're still 15, 16, 17. You're going to do some stupid stuff. It's what 15, 16, 17 year olds do. You know, it's like, you know, when people are like, wow, you're so wise, Mr. Anderton. I'm like, yeah, because I've fallen on my face enough times to learn. You know, that's where they're at. They're at that learning to fall on their face to learn from their mistakes and learn. No example of this is I am a sarcastic teacher. I tend to be sarcastic and joke around with my students. Um, this goes back also to the first one. Sometimes I cross over the line and I'm a little bit more sarcastic or a little more scathing than I mean to be. You know, if you've ever been around sarcastic people, that happens every time now and then, like where they say something and just so hits a little bit too, too close to home. And I apologize when I do that. And if I did it in front of the whole class, I'm going to apologize in front of the whole class. That's just part of, once again, modeling what I want out of them. But with this, it's when the kids come back with their sarcasm. Because I know where that line is, and I generally am very good about not crossing it. They don't necessarily know where the line is. And so every now and then, they'll come back with a comeback, and I'm just like, whoa, 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 wait a second. That was over the line. That was inappropriate. You, you don't talk to me that way. But because of this rule, I don't immediately write them up for being disrespectful and send them to the principal's office. They're learning how to use sarcasm. They're learning how to joke around and not cross the lines. So the first time we talk about it and it's a warning. Now, if it continues, and becomes repetitive, then they're gonna to go to the principal's office because then they're being disrespectful. But they're learning, they're going to make mistakes. You know, that's why I have like a, a late homework policy. No, I don't expect them to turn in homework perfectly every single time. You know, that's why I have a drop quiz grade. Now, back to late homework, I'm, I'm a firm believer if I don't see it in 24 hours, I'm not gonna ever see it until mommy and daddy complain at the end of the semester of why there's a zero there. But my rule is 24 hours. I understand something may have happened that you didn't get it done. If you get it to me at the beginning of class the next day, we're good. Um, I'll take off a few points, but it's not a zero and we move on. Um, and so I do that with them. Because this last strategy comes down very much to this. When you win the hearts of your students, you will win their minds. When your students know that you are for them, when your students know that you respect them, when your students know that you care, then they're going to pay attention in your class. You know, there's the old saying, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. It is so true in the classroom. We need to communicate that care. So like when you know, students are working on something, they come up to us and ask us a question. Do we respond with an attitude that speaks, not necessarily verbally, but speaks to them in terms of our actions? Why are you bothering me? Or does our posture ask, hey, I'm glad you're here. Come, let's, let's, let's work on this. No, thank you for taking the initiative to ask a question. No, like, are we communicating that? Are we communicating that we want them to ask questions? Are we communicating that we want them to wrestle with it? Are we communicating, are we fighting against those lies? Because those, you know, we've all had those kids walk into our classroom who says, I can't do math, I can't do science, I can't do chemistry, and it's a load of hogwash. And we've got to fight those lies. And we've got to go after their hearts and fight those lies and show them that, yes, they can. You know, I had a girl last year who started the year low B, high C. You know, she just wasn't, didn't seem to be all that strong of a student. But she kind of had some learned helplessness in there. Um, she really hadn't had somebody challenge her and believe in her. And so I worked with her and I pushed her and I put her with partners who would encourage her and help her grow. By the time she got to the end of the year, she was making mid A's, you know? And I remember seeing her get in the car with her mom at carpool and just walking up to her mom and saying, I am so proud of her 
for how I've seen her grow this year, you know, and just seeing the smile on her face, the smile on her mom's face, but it's because I went after her heart. I believed in her heart and I won her mind in the process. To me, that is the art, one of the biggest arts of teaching is the foundation of, and the core of all of my teaching. When their hearts and their minds will surely follow. So these tips are real. I mean, chemistry is hard enough without our kids being checked out. We need to communicate as best we can. We need to know our stuff. We need to limit those distractions and the impact they have on our classroom and we've got to go after their hearts. Because when we do that, and they're, that, they're so much more likely to be engaged in our class when we take care of those things. And then chemistry becomes easier when they're engaged. And these aren't theory. Like I said, this is the foundation of how I've been teaching for years. And these apply to you whether you're a brand new teacher or you've been teaching for years and years. We are always, I love that about teaching, that we can always learn something new. We can always push on to the next thing. You know, every quarter or semester is a new starting point to learn something new and to try something new. So what's this all about? What I really want to push here is that this is about being proactive. We generally, especially if this is your second or third time through teaching chemistry, you know where the hard parts are. You know where you're going to have student engagement issues. You know there's a pep rally next week. You know there's a half day that week, whatever. Be proactive to keep them engaged. Like for me, um, the day before Thanksgiving break and the day before spring break, I almost always give a quiz because it's a natural day that the kids want to just slack off and not be engaged. So I forced them to be engaged by giving them a quiz. Um, and so I'm being proactive um, to keep them engaged. Um, like I said, it's about engaging your students. And I am passionate about teachers having a life outside of school. And I firmly believe that if we can master student engagement, what it does is it makes our class time easier. It takes less out of us emotionally and physically when we have a class that's engaged. They're, more, they're easier to teach. They're more fun to teach. It's more energizing. Where that class where you're pulling teeth just sucks it out of you. And when you have a classes that suck life out of you, when you go home, you have no life to give to your family and friends. And I don't want that for you or anybody. So my goal is to give you tips to make your class time easier so that you have energy to bring home. Because now, as much as I love my kids and as much as I love teaching, you know, I've taught hundreds and hundreds of kids. I run into like one or two a year that I see again. But my own kids, I see every day, and I will see them for years and years and years and years and years to come. Same thing with my wife. So as much as I love investing in my kids and investing in my classroom, I want to have the energy and the reserves left to invest in my family and my friends back home. Because to me, that's, that's the long-term investment. That's the real thing I want to build and value over the years and years to come. So I'm really, really passionate about that. So I'm not sure why you showed up today, but I want you to know just one thing. And I want you to know that you can do it. This is from the scene in Waterboy where they're about to face the, you know, the, the national, state, national champion, state champions, whatever. The big team that's never been beaten. You know, and sometimes we can feel that way. We've got that kid who's just so disengaged. We feel like we'll never be able to beat them, beat them, to get them engaged. To beat them is the wrong word, but we'll never be able to beat their disengagement. We'll never be able to help them in our class, but we can. It's possible. Um, students are still going to make their choices. The child can still choose to not be engaged, even after we've done everything we can do. But for the most part, when we really bust it and try and take proactive control of our classrooms, it'll go the way that we want it to. So like I said, we're teaching high school chem. 
And our passion is to give teachers the resources and the support. Um, when you registered for this webinar, the first email you should have gotten should have had a download link in it that gave you access to all of our free resources. Um, a great activity for ionic nomenclature, uh, lessons on balancing reactions, lessons on doing conversions, and a lab safety audit. And so those are all there for you, and those are free resources for you. But we also have a membership site. Um, and the membership site has two, two aspects to it, a basic and a plus. The basic is just all the resources, kind of like you're gonna see when I give you my covalent nomenclature unit here in a moment, is it's all the handouts. Every student classwork, homework, quizzes, reviews, tests. Basically all the resources you could want for every unit for the entire year. Um, meeting state standards across the board, as many of them as I've checked. And then, but people are like, well, but can I find that like on teachers, pay teachers and other places like that? I'm like, well, yeah, but a lot of time those are, and I've looked at them, either you're pulling in a bunch of things from a bunch of different places and they don't match. And that just makes it hard and confusing for you and your kids when one handout on limiting reaction talks about it one way and another handout does it a different way. All of our handouts are consistent because they've all things that I've written over the course of my teaching career. Um, and they all work together and they all flow together and you're not spending hours scouring the internet looking for things. It's all in one place, a whole year's worth of stuff all together. The plus level, what it does is I take all of that and then I add the mentoring and the support to not only have the content, but how to teach it. My teaching notes and then also instructional videos on all of my notes that explain, Hey, here's how you teach it. If you have this issue or this issue, this is where kids are going to have a problem. Look at this, do this. Um, um, then you have keys for all the handouts. I do a weekly Q&A every Tuesday afternoon where if teach, teachers have questions, they can ask them and I'll answer them. Or I will generally talk on some teaching topic um, and try to give you know just encouragement and support on how to teach and how to teach chemistry and how to teach it well. And then we also have a private Facebook group where teachers can encourage one another, celebrate our wins, ask our questions, and get support from each other. So how much will it cost? To me, the simplest way to look at this is how much it will cost you not to do this. If our resources and our support can save you an hour a day, over the course of a school year, that's 180 hours. It's over six days. It's over six days of time that you can be with your family. Like instead of leaving school at five, you can leave school at four and have an extra hour with your kids or with your friends or family or spouse. That's critical. So to me, what it costs to not do it is this. It would cost family. It would cost just family time of being together. And so in terms of actual costs, <laughs> um, the plus plan comes to $37 a month, uh, just over a buck a day. Um, a buck a day to radically streamline your curriculum to give you the resources and everything you need to really fast track your growth as a chemistry teacher. And to, like I said, make the teaching part of your day as efficient and as smooth as possible so that you have as much energy as you can to be with your friends and family back home. You know, that's really what we're all about. And so it's only available until tomorrow evening at midnight Eastern. Um, and then I will be closing the cart at that point in time. Um, so you can look at all the details. If you go to teachinghighschoolchem.com, um, you'll see all the details there. Um, and they kind of give you an idea of what you're looking at. What the plus plan looks like is what you're getting from me. Okay, if you go to teachinghighschoolchem.com slash member slash covalent, this is the covalent page from my membership site. You'll see I have a section on prerequisites, um, a little quiz to make sure you know what the heck you're talking about before you teach the lesson, um, and then kind of a, a general pacing guide, and then all of the resources. The only resource you do not have on this free version of the covalent nomenclature, nomenclature unit is the keys. 
I do not have the keys because this is a public access page, meaning you know, anybody who has this web address can access that page. They don't have to be a member, which means students could access that page. And the last thing I want is for students to get their hands on keys, because that would be a tragedy. Um, same thing, when you become a member, I need to, you know, I'll be looking at Facebook profiles or some way to verify that you're a teacher before I allow you to have access to the keys. For that very same reason, that I want to ensure that I don't have that issue where some students are willing to spend, you know, collectively spend $37 and download all the keys, and that would be tragic to say the least. And so that ends the webinar. If you have any questions, I'll be on for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, and so you can just drop those in the chat and I will answer any questions you have. Um, like I said, go to Teaching High School. I'll send out an email shortly uh, with a link to teachinghighschoolchem.com to the PDF of these slides for this webinar, the link to that covalent page, um, and I'll have that all sent out to you probably within the next 20 minutes or so. So thank you for your time this afternoon.